So Bennett, you're the news of the day. Leaving Blackstone, the firm where you built one of the largest and most successful credit businesses on Wall Street, why? Why leave? Yes. Well, a um, host of reasons. I think first and foremost, I think uh, the firm's in really good shape. Um, Dwight Scott, our president, has been really running the firm day to day for the last two years. I think the firm's hitting on practically all cylinders, raising lots of capital, uh, deploying our, our funds and smart investments. Um, and I think everybody's kind of ready. On a personal basis, I've accomplished what I've set out to do. And after 15 years, you know, I think it's time for some new challenges. If there's one mantra or one principle you want to survive at GSO after you leave, what would it be? It would be making our LPs a priority. They are our ultimate customers. They are the ones that, that provide us with the capital. I think we've been good stewards of that capital. Very proud of the way we have conducted ourselves in a uh, transparent uh, manner. Quite, um, quite proud of uh, the returns that we've been able to generate for them. Uh, and I also have great pride in the, the culture that we've created at GSO so that um, all that survives me and um, will continue on. GSO has some $25 billion of dry powder right now. It's a tricky time to be deploying capital in credit markets. How would you describe the investing climate as we speak? Well, I, I, I agree. It's tricky. Um, valuations are very high. Mm -hmm. um, lots of competition for deals. So um, it's a time when, you know, you want to be cautious. But nonetheless, there's still things to do. Uh, not the ideal time to be reaching for risk. Uh, but we see a lot of um, lower risk things on a relative scale that we're, we're active in, particularly in our direct lending activities, and uh, plenty, plenty to keep us busy. So when you say caution, give people a sense of how they should be thinking. If they can take one thing away from all of Ben Goodman's experience and his track record at GSO, what you've seen over time, how cautious should they be relative to other points in the continuum of the history of credit markets? Well, I guess uh, words of caution, uh, don't get caught up in fads. Just because the marketplace is uh, complacent, it's probably a good time for you to be more conservative. Just because there's lots of uh, liquidity chasing transactions uh, good to hit the pause button, reevaluate uh, your investment thesis, uh, ask around and try to get different perspectives. Um, lots of different views tend to help come to an investment conclusion. And in an environment like this, I think it's particularly important to have uh, a lot of broad perspectives um, and make sure that you are, are checking and double checking what you think needs to go right and more importantly, uh, what can possibly go wrong. Does that describe what you and Dwight are doing at GSO right now and what you're going to be doing still for the next four months before you step down officially on December the 31st? Hitting the pause button, stepping back and not participating in some of the deals we see getting shopped around? Well, I think it's a balance. Um, in the last 12 months, we put $10 billion to work. And that's a lot. In what we think are some pretty smart transactions. Uh, things like Cobham, uh, Targa Resources. Uh, we did a large billion dollar commitment for AccuSure. So there are things to do there, um, but these are not transactions that Wall Street is you know, bringing to us. We're not, we're not deploying capital in public markets. We're originating our own deal flow where we have a point of view and we have a perspective and we're deploying capital in those industries behind management teams that we have a lot of confidence in. Bennett, we've had glimpses of the next credit meltdown, right? We had one glimpse in the first quarter of 2016. We had another glimpse in the fourth quarter of 2018. When the sell-off, the big one, finally comes, how do you think it plays out? Well, one, I... I, I believe we will have a sell-off. Uh, cycles are, are not extinct, although we haven't seen one in quite a while, that, on any kind of a prolonged basis. I think the next cycle will be driven more about valuation and the recalibration of how risk is priced. 
Uh, I don't see another 2008 uh, recession. I think uh, whatever kind of economic downturn we ultimately have will be relatively short-lived. Um, I also believe that uh, there's a lot of capital on the sidelines. We're not the only ones that have a lot of dry powder. And I think that um, that repricing of, of risk will serve as an opportunity for people to want to put more capital to work. So risk may be repriced at because of all that capital available at a at a higher level than it might have otherwise been no, when there wasn't no. so much dry powder? I think um, when things get repriced this time around, it's not going to be because of macroeconomic factors. It's going to be some sort of geopolitical event, whether that's a trade war uh, with China, whether that's um, some kind of a conflict in the Middle East. Um, the fundamental economy today, as we see it, is actually doing okay. What about liquidity? We've seen at least a couple of loans, um, Clover Technologies, for example, Deluxe Entertainment, which suggest the behavior of those repricings suggest that maybe there isn't as much liquidity out there as some might believe. Well, there's no hiding from the fact that we're towards the end of some kind of cycle. So uh, those deals in today's environment, the triple C, B minus rated credits that are trying to get done in the public markets, are having some difficulties getting done. I don't think um, that's a surprise. Uh, I do think you know, people realize that um, uh, highly leveraged transactions with lots of pro forma EBITDA um, forget having a, a lack of covenants. Um, that's been long gone for, for quite a while. Um, um, would precipitate people being a little more discerning in terms of what they put into their portfolios today. We have seen five leverage loan deals pulled, I believe, this month. Is that because underwriters are trying to foist crappy loans on the market or because investors or losing their appetite? More the latter, less the former. Um, the, the investors are reading day in and day out uh, all of the press clippings, and you'd have to be uh, in hibernation uh, not to notice that there are a lot of skeptics out there. So I, th I just think it's, it's more a reflection of these are fringe deals. Um, they probably don't deserve to get done in the, uh, in the public markets, and I just think it's normal course uh, buyer beware type of activity. Now, what about distress? There are more bonds trading at distress levels today than there were in the fourth quarter of 2018, though nowhere near as much as we saw in the first quarter of 2016. How much longer will the credit market be open to, let's call them, troubled borrowers? Well, I think it depends on the borrower. If you're a highly levered company in a industry going through secular change, that's going to be an issue. Very difficult as a creditor to sort out what's happening in the retailing industry. Uh, very difficult to be able to anticipate some of the changes going on when, in, in media-related businesses, publishing-related assets. Um, if it's a company um, tied to UK activity, uh, in the face of a hard Brexit. These are risks, as a creditor, you don't really get paid for. So you're probably just going to pull back and let others try to sort out what the appropriate pricing ought to be for transactions like that. What about CLOs? GSO is, if I'm not mistaken, the largest CLO manager. If CLOs offered a hedge against rising interest rates, does demand for CLOs collapse if rates keep falling further? I don't think demand will collapse, although the arbitrage might get taken out of the marketplace. Effectively, a CLO is a pool of leverage loans with a certain yield financed by nine to one leverage. If the cost of the leverage doesn't go down at a time when the price of the assets go up, you can't earn a low double digit return on equity. And that's the arbitrage. So in today's world, there are fewer buyers of the triple A tranche. And while asset prices have moved up, the pricing of those triple A liabilities have not fallen. So I think you'll see the ebb and flow of the CLO market um, 
um, go up, go down. I don't think it's anything permanent. I don't think the efficacy of the CLO structure uh, is going to be a cause of some domino impact of cascading defaults and, and, and a, a cause of concern. Um, but I think it's more a question of we won't be able to find new equity that in today's world gets priced at an 8% return and historically those CLOs have yielded 12 to 13% returns. One last one for you, Ben. At 62 is way too young <laughs> to retire. What's the next chapter for Ben Goodman? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it's going to take me some time to sort all that out. But I will say this. Uh, I am genuinely uh, excited about my new role uh, at Blackstone uh, come January of 2020. Well, where I will be a senior advisor to the firm, I'm going to maintain my chairman role on our BDC and direct lending activities. That's a business that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, and I um, will be able to continue to work on investment committee, continue to source deals for them, um, and, and, and be involved. Uh, I am going to start a family office, so I'm getting close to signing a lease. I've been hiring a few people. Uh, longer term, um, if there is a, another chapter you know, I'd have to identify a sector or an investment strategy where I think there's great value. Uh, regardless, uh, whatever I do in my next life uh, is certainly not going to be at the scale of what I did at Blackstone.